In this tutorial, we'll look at photosynthesis. The first aim is to describe the chemical equation for photosynthesis, then explain how a leaf is adapted for photosynthesis, and then finally explain how limiting factors affect the rate of photosynthesis. Personally, I feel plants are hugely underappreciated by students. But if you look closely, you'll see there's as much variation in the plant kingdom as there is in the animal kingdom. Without plants, life as we know it would simply cease to exist. In this lesson, we're going to examine the chemical reaction that plants carry out. So let's first deal with the idea of why students find plants boring. Well, in this day and age, when we can get anything we want just by pressing a button, whether it's a TV program, a piece of information, or something we want to buy online, comparatively, plants move at a much slower rate, which can lead us to the conclusion that plants don't seem to do much and they're quite boring. But if you think about it, plants have to do absolutely everything an animal has to do to survive. They have to move, they have to carry out respiration, they have to respond to the environment around them. They have to grow and also get rid of waste products. They have to overcome all these challenges with the added hindrance of being stuck in one spot. There are two processes that plants carry out that really shine through. Firstly, reproduction. Plants have evolved dazzling ways of carrying out reproduction. You see, they have to pass on their genes like any animal does. And many plants have co-evolved with specific animals to help them carry out reproduction. For example, some insect pollinators are attracted to the scent of a flower or the colour of a flower. And they're usually rewarded with nectar inside. And of course, bees can use nectar to make honey. Some plants actually take on the appearance of other organisms. So they trick animals into thinking they found a mate. And when they try and mate with a the plant, they collect pollen. Pollen is the plant equivalent of sperm. That pollen is then transported to other plants so reproduction can take place. Some plants, however, don't rely on animals but rather on the wind to help them carry out pollination. Some plants have even evolved a way to stink of rotting meat to attract flies as their pollinators, such as the carrion flower. But I think one of the most remarkable challenges that plants have overcome is evolving the ability to feed themselves. They do this through the process of photosynthesis. That's one word. Photo means light and synthesis means make. In this case, we're making food from the energy in light. And it's the leaves of plants that carry out this miraculous process. Leaves are food factories for plants. But if you're still not convinced, think about it this way. Through little openings on the underside of a leaf called stomata, plants will take the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the soil. Now already there's a benefit to us. By removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, we're reducing the greenhouse effect, which is contributing to global warming. Anyway, once carbon dioxide and water vapour have entered the leaf, under the influence of light energy from the sun, plants will chemically react those raw ingredients to make carbohydrates. Now just consider that for a second. 150 million kilometres away, our nearest star, the sun, is smashing hydrogen atoms together in the process of nuclear fusion. This releases little packets of light called photons which travel 150 million kilometres and occasionally strike the leaf of a plant. That journey takes about 8 minutes. Using that energy, plants react carbon dioxide and water and turn it into physical matter in the form of sugars such as glucose which plants will then use in respiration to make energy. But also they can store this energy as wood which we can then use to make furniture and so on. And plants, as a waste product, produce one other thing, oxygen. Now, without oxygen, we certainly couldn't survive. For one, we need oxygen to carry out respiration, that chemical process that gives us energy. But also, oxygen reacts with itself high up in the atmosphere to form ozone, which protects us from UV radiation. My point is, plants are our saviours. Without them, we would not exist. And they perform all this miraculous life-giving stuff without batting an eyelid. They barely seem to move at all. That's one impressive magic trick. It may also interest you to know that scientists are currently looking into whether plants actually communicate using sound. It's long been known that plants communicate using biochemical messages, but there is some evidence to suggest that they do communicate with sound as well. For example, when traumatised. Think about that next time you mow your lawn. So let's try and understand the chemical reaction that is photosynthesis. Now I'm going to start off by showing you the chemical reaction for respiration again, if you've seen that tutorial. If you remember, respiration occurs when we react glucose with oxygen and produce carbon dioxide, water and energy. The reason I'm showing you this is because when you see the photosynthesis equation, you'll realise it's the same but in reverse. So plants will react carbon dioxide and water 
under the influence of light energy to produce glucose and oxygen. One common misconception students have is that plants carry out photosynthesis but animals carry out respiration. Remember, every single living thing, be it plant, bacteria or animal, needs to carry out the process of respiration. Plants can basically use the products of photosynthesis and feed it into the respiration equation for energy. And similarly, they can use the products of respiration to feed it into the photosynthesis equation. That's quite a remarkable trick. But during the day, because photosynthesis requires light, the rate of photosynthesis is greater than the rate of respiration. Plants generally have a low rate of respiration because they don't move quickly at all. They have no muscles to contract, for example. They have no nervous system to run. But after the sun sets at night time, the rate of respiration is significantly greater than the rate of photosynthesis. And that's because photosynthesis is dependent upon light energy. So make sure you know these equations for the exam. So that's how we describe the chemical equation for photosynthesis. So now let's look at how a leaf is adapted for photosynthesis and gas exchange. This is a diagram of a leaf in cross section. I've drawn it thicker obviously than usual so you can see what's going on inside. So if you remember from the photosynthesis equation, a plant will need carbon dioxide and water under the influence of light energy and will produce glucose and oxygen. All these ingredients will need to be transported inside, to and from the plant and plants have developed many adaptations to help them do this. So firstly, let's consider the plant's shape. It is large and flat. In other words, a plant's leaf has a large surface area to absorb or capture as many light rays as it can, which it needs for photosynthesis. In fact, if you stand under a tree and look up on a sunny day, you'll see that very little light gets through. The leaves also try and orientate themselves so they minimize overlap. This occurs so that a tree can absorb as much light as possible for photosynthesis. It's called a leaf mosaic. So if we stay on plant adaptations for capturing light, the next thing we should look at is the leaf palisade cell. This is the poster child cell for plants. Whenever you see a plant cell, let's say in a key stage 3 textbook, it'll usually be the leaf palisade cell. Leaf palisade cells have everything a normal plant cell does, a cell wall, a cell membrane, a nucleus, cytoplasm, a vacuole, but most importantly it contains chloroplasts, lots of them. The word palisade means defence, so I like to think of the Roman army with their big rectangular shields. You can see the shape bears a resemblance. But instead of blocking arrows, these cells are adapted for absorbing rays of sunlight. So the chloroplast is where the magic happens. They're a bit like cousins of the mitochondria where respiration happens. Chloroplast is where sugars are made. It's no coincidence that these cells are found near the top of the leaf, virtually the first point of contact for sunlight. So that explains adaptations for sunlight. What about carbon dioxide and gases? Well, on the underside of a leaf, you will find tiny pores called stomata or stoma for one. These pores use water pressure to open and close. This gives the plant some level of control. Remember, if carbon dioxide can enter a plant, water vapor can also leave a plant and cause the leaf to dry. That's why sometimes these must be closed. Here you can see a picture of some stomata under a microscope. So stomata allow carbon dioxide and oxygen in and out of the cell through the process of diffusion. Next we have another layer which is useful for gas exchange. This is called the spongy mesophyll layer, though you can just call it the spongy layer if you wish. Now the spongy layer are loosely packed and that allows gases to easily diffuse through to the palisade cells where photosynthesis is happening. Similarly, it allows gases to diffuse out as well. So now we've looked at carbon dioxide and oxygen, we've also looked at light. What about water? Well, plants don't have a circulatory system like ours, but they do have one. But instead of having veins and arteries, they have xylem and phloem vessels. Let's look at the xylem first. The xylem transports water and minerals. Xylem tubes are very easy to see. If you've ever eaten a stick of celery, you can see the long, tough tubes. Now, you can do a little experiment by putting the celery in some dyed water. And a day later, you can see that the water has travelled up these tubes. So the xylem is like an elevator for water, taking water all the way up from the roots to the leaves. Identifying the function of xylem vessels is quite a popular exam question. Here's a little trick to help you remember. First, hold your palms out and make an X. That X is for xylem. Next, stick two fingers out on either side to make a W. That W is for water because xylem transports water. Now flip your hand the other way around and you have an M. 
that M is for minerals because xylem transports water and minerals. So if you forget, just remember that hand gesture and hopefully it'll come back to you. Next we have phloem vessels. Now if xylem transports materials up to the leaf, the phloem transports materials away from the leaf. More specifically, it transports glucose in the form of sap. So the glucose is made by the palisade cells and the phloem transports the glucose to other parts of the plant for respiration and storage. Identifying the function of a phloem is also very important in exams. So now we can see how every part of the leaf caters for each part of this equation. Now you could get a six marker that asks you to explain how a leaf is adapted for photosynthesis or how a leaf is adapted for gas exchange. This table will help you summarise the main points. Firstly, leaf shape. You can see that we have a large surface area to absorb sunlight, but also leaves are very thin, which means that gases don't have to travel very far to get to the cells which carry out photosynthesis. So yellow points are for photosynthesis and blue points are for gas exchange. Next, the spongy mesophyll layer is loosely packed so gases can easily diffuse through the leaf. Next, for photosynthesis, leaf palisade cells near the top of the leaf contain many chloroplasts and those chloroplasts are used for photosynthesis. Now for gas exchange, we have stomata on the underside of the leaf. They can open and close so gases can diffuse in and out of the leaf. If you have to identify stomata by picture in exam, that's generally what they tend to look like, like little lips. The xylem over here transports water and minerals from the root to the leaf. The phloem found here will transport sugars away from the leaf for storage and respiration. And finally, while we are discussing plant structure, I thought I'd introduce the root hair cell. Now while the root hair cell isn't used explicitly for photosynthesis or gas exchange, it is a very important adaptation a plant has. Root hair cells have a weird Pinocchio nose-like extension that juts out from the side. What this does is provide a large surface area for absorption of water and minerals from the soil. So if you ever look at the roots of a plant, it will look hairy. And you can just about make that out over here in this image. So if you need to pause and make notes on this table, please feel free to do so. Just make sure you know the difference between adaptations for photosynthesis and capturing light and adaptations for gas exchange, as they are two different six mark questions. And that is how you explain how a leaf is adapted for photosynthesis and gas exchange. So now let's look at the idea of limiting factors. If you've seen the tutorial on enzymes, I've already mentioned these. Plants grow, and any factor that can stop a plant growing is called a limiting factor. Once again, I'm going to feed this into this equation because it's all about this equation. So let's say I want my plant to grow and I decide to water it, as many people do. So the first thing I do is add water to my plant. Now, my plant starts to grow. The more water I add, the more it grows. If I stop watering the plant, then the plant will stop growing. So at the moment, water is the limiting factor because it's directly affecting plant growth. But let's say I continue to water my plant, and my plant grows and then stops. And no matter how much more I water it, it's not growing. This is an indicator that something else is now limiting plant growth. In other words, we have a new limiting factor. So I'm gonna assume here that it's light. So I'm gonna give my plant more light. And lo and behold, my plant starts to grow again. So now light is the limiting factor, but after a while it stops. So something else is now limiting plant growth. Perhaps carbon dioxide is now the limiting factor. So I give my plant more carbon dioxide and it continues to grow. But once again, it stops. Now what could be limiting it? Well, photosynthesis is a chemical reaction and all chemical reactions require energy. Increasing the temperature is the easiest way to provide more energy to the system. So my plant continues to grow. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of what limiting factors are and how they affect plant growth. You can investigate limiting factors really easily in a lab. Here I'm investigating light intensity. What I've got is an aquatic plant such as Canadian pondweed and I've submerged it under water in a beaker. The reason why we need an aquatic plant is so when it produces oxygen through the process of photosynthesis, we can see the bubbles being produced. The more oxygen bubbles that are being produced, the faster the rate of photosynthesis. So for this experiment, you need a long ruler, like a meter ruler. You need a stop clock. You need something in the water to make sure that carbon dioxide levels aren't the limiting factor. Remember, you want light intensity to be the only limiting factor in this experiment. So you must control all others. Here I'm using sodium hydrogen carbonate. It's a soluble tablet that will basically dissolve and produce carbon dioxide. I will also need another beaker of water, or you could use a water bath to control temperature. But what this does is it absorbs the heat from the lamp, but still allows light through. 
This ensures that temperature is constant and doesn't affect the rate of photosynthesis. So what I do is I just move the lamp closer to the pond weed over here and I count how many bubbles leave every single minute. The closer I bring the lamp, the greater the light intensity, so the bubbles will start to leave at a faster rate, you'd assume, because photosynthesis is happening at a faster rate. So I could count bubbles per minute, but I could also use a gas syringe to collect that oxygen and give me a precise volume of oxygen produced every minute. So you need to be able to interpret limiting factor data using graphs. So if we look at this one first on light intensity, in other words, my experiment, you can see that as I increase light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis also increases. But after a while, it levels off. That's how you would describe this graph. It increases and then levels off. What that means is over this region, light intensity is the limiting factor. However, after this point in region B, we can continue to increase light intensity, but we don't get any increase in rate of photosynthesis. In other words, something else is now the limiting factor. It could be carbon dioxide, it could be water, it could be temperature. So now if we look at carbon dioxide concentration, we get exactly the same pattern. Remember that carbon dioxide is one of the raw materials needed to drive photosynthesis. So as we increase carbon dioxide concentration, the rate of photosynthesis goes up. So over region A, carbon dioxide is the limiting factor. After a while, the rate of photosynthesis levels off. That indicates that something else is now the limiting factor. It could be water, it could be light intensity, it could be temperature. So unless we increase one of these, we are not going to see any further gain in rates of photosynthesis. Be aware that in an exam you will not get this division line in A and B. I've just put that there so it's easier for you to follow. And finally, let's look at temperature. Now you'll notice temperature curve has a different shape. But if you've seen the tutorial on enzymes, you'll recognize this sort of shock, thin shape immediately. So what's going on here? Well, increasing temperature provides more energy for photosynthesis to occur, so the rate of photosynthesis increases. However, after this point, increasing temperature not only causes photosynthesis to level off, it actually causes a decline in the rate of photosynthesis. And the reason for this is because photosynthesis is carried out by enzymes. If it gets too hot, then the enzymes will denature and photosynthesis will no longer be carried out. But when you consider that many plants live in baking hot deserts, obviously they're quite robust when it comes to increases in temperature. You'd really have to cook a plant to stop it being able to photosynthesize. On average, it happens at around 45 degrees Celsius. Now, while environmental conditions never really get that hot, in a greenhouse, if you're not carefully monitoring the conditions, they can get over 45 degrees Celsius, which would cause a lot of problems for your plants. That's how you explain how limiting factors affect the rate of photosynthesis.